So let's start. Lesson one. You all there? Uh, the following says warm up. The following sample probability questions were asked in junior high math. I need the chatter to stop. Hey, we're starting. That corner. Thank you. I don't know. What did I say? Page 423, I think I said. Or 424. Something like that. Okay. A fair die is rolled. By the way, English vocabulary, two dice, one die. I'll often say one dice because it's kind of become an idiom that's part of our language. But if you're reading a book and they talk about a die, that is the singular of dice. We'll be grammatically correct in our typing or on the exams. A fair die is rolled. What's the probability of rolling a one? Now, intuitively, you know the answer to this. In fact, basic probability, we have a reasonably good intuition on. But anything beyond really basic, we're lousy on. Hence Vegas, hence horoscopes, hence gam all, all the super all the patterns we try and find. Uh, we're really lousy at it. So basics, one out of six. A circle is divided into four equal sectors labeled clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. When it's spun, what's the probability it lands on hearts? One out of four. <coughs> Two coins are thrown, and the number of heads is counted. What's the probability of getting two heads when you throw two coins? That was a bit of a trickier question. Let's find out. It seems to me that you could get heads on the first, heads on the second, tails on the first, heads on the second, tails on the first, tails on the second. Am I missing anything? Pardon me? I'm missing one. Heads on the first, tails on the second. Have I missed any possibilities? By the way, can you see the possibility for permutations and combinations to start showing up if I treat this as a way? Later. Yes, that's why we always do combinations before we do probabilities. Um, yeah, I think it's one out of four, looks like. And one of the first things we're going to start to ask ourselves is, is there a way to get this without counting? But a short rule we have in probability is this. If you can count it, you can calculate it. When in doubt, write them out, count them up. Now, that works great for small questions. It doesn't work great for picking five cards or anything like that. Too many possibilities. Terminology. Probability theory deals with the mathematics of chance or prediction. We're going to use the following terminology. A trial is any operation whose outcome cannot be predicted with certainty. For example, flipping a coin, rolling a dice. Dropping a ball is not a trial because I know it's going to hit the ground. What are the odds of the ball hitting the ground? 100%, as long as there's no desk or something in the way. But any event where there is some uncertainty about more than one outcome, we call that a trial. An experiment consists of actually doing one or more trials. <clears throat> We're going to use those fairly interchangeably, though. An outcome is the result of carrying out an experiment. Flip a coin, get a heads, the outcome is heads. Roll three dice, the outcome is a six, a six, and a four. The sample space, often used with a capital letter S, is the set of all possible outcomes. Here is the sample space for flipping two coins. There are no other outcomes beyond those four. And an event is a subset of the sample space. For example, this question was asking about the event two heads from this sample space. Heads, an even number could be an event if you were rolling a dice. And here's our first official definition of probability. This one's pretty intuitive, 
I'll you know highlight it, but I think most of you naturally understood this when you guys gave me the one out of six answer. If an experiment has a set of equally likely possible outcomes, then the probability of a particular event A is given by the formula. We're going to use some notation, Jen, lots of shorthand. Instead of writing the word probability, you know what letter we're going to use? A capital letter what? P. And then we're going to do an open bracket, and the event is going to go in the brackets. In this case, the event A. And it's the number of outcomes favorable to A divided by the total number of possible outcomes. Probability of heads, 1 out of 2. Probability of getting a 5 when you roll a die, 1 out of 6. So this is going to be our notation. Pretty good. Pretty short. What's the probability of something being impossible? If something's impossible, what's its probability? If it's impossible, we would say p of x is 0. For example, what's the probability of rolling a 9 on a six-sided standard die? Can you get a 9? No, 0. Okay. That doesn't sound very profound. It's more profound than you think. Oh, and if something is guaranteed to occur, we say that it has a probability of 1, 100% if you want to think about it as a percentage. For example, what's the probability of rolling a natural number less than 7? What are the natural numbers less than 7? Uh, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. What's the probability of rolling a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or a 4 or a 5 or a 6 on a die? Guaranteed. What's the probability of rolling a heads or a tails? Guaranteed. Okay? <clears throat> so guaranteed mathematically, 1. That gives us our first built-in error check. Gives us our first built-in error check, Rio. For any event A, the odds of it occurring have to be between 0 and 1. If you get an answer bigger than 1, you've messed up. You've done something wrong on your calculator. You've forgotten brackets. You've done something. If you get a negative answer, you've messed up. All probabilities are either impossible or guaranteed or anything in between. Often we're interested in the odds of something not occurring. And we have an abbreviation or a shorthand for the word not. If we draw a horizontal bar above something, we read that as not A. When I write this, this is actually the probability of not A occurring. And we call it the complement of A. Oh, and there's a handy dandy little equation. The probability of not A, or not A, is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. That's on your formula sheet, but it's worth having in your brain. Let me give you an example. Supposing they tell you the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow is 1 out of 3. What's the probability that it's not going to rain tomorrow then? 2 out of 3. That's going to become handy because, Dylan, you're going to find for a lot of questions, it's way easier to find the complement than it is to actually find the answer to the question that you're looking for. But then you just go 1 minus the complement, and you're done. We're going to use that all the time. So this formula here is on your formula sheet. But, Jen, I'm going to say you'll memorize it naturally because it's kind of intuitive. For each of the examples, it says state the sp sample space which outcomes are favorable, whether the outcomes are equally likely, and the probability of the event. So a fair die is rolled. What's the sample space for a fair die? And traditionally, we use the squiggly brackets because it's a set. What are the outcomes for a fair die? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, the event it asks is, what's the probability of rolling a 1? Okay. I think that's, and I'm just going to circle it, that event right there. What is the probability of rolling a 1? We all know this one. If it's a fair die, what is the probability? 
one out of six. Oh, are all these outcomes, I should have answered part three, are all these outcomes equally likely? Is it this? Yeah, that's going to be a key right now. Right now, we can't handle non-equally likely outcomes. We will in a couple of days. We'll add a clever trick. A circular spinner is divided into four equal sec sectors. We did this one already. We said the answer was one out of four. Two coins are thrown and the number of heads is counted. What's the probability of obtaining two heads? We did this one already as well. We listed our sample space. We'll do this one over here though. We said the sample space was... Now it depends how you list the sample space. If you list the sample space as heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, uh, you can get two heads one head or no heads, are all of these equally likely? And the answer is no, because you can get that two different ways. And so we would either have to list it the way that I did earlier by calling it heads one, heads two, tails one, tails two, heads one, tails two, tails one, heads two, and then they're all equally likely. Or preview of coming attractions. So not equally likely. In fact, if I was doing this question, I wouldn't list my sample space this way. I would list my sample space as the way I did before. Heads one, heads two. Heads one, tails two. Tails one, Heads two. And what have I missed? Uh, tails one, tails two. And there, I think those are all equally likely because each of them will only occur once. And then I could get the answer of one out of four, not one out of three. Probability of heads, heads is one out of four. So in part B says, why can't you use the number of outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes? You can't for the blue set here because they're not equally likely. Okay. Next page. Compound events. Events formed from repeated trials or from a combination of simple events are called compound events. And often a table, a chart, or a tree diagram is useful in determining the sample space. The two we're going to use the most are a tree diagram and a chart. In fact, we'll use a tree diagram, Nick, 90% of the time. We'll use a chart a small amount of the time, and you'll figure out pretty quickly when we use what. When we use what says this, consider an experiment of rolling three equally spaced, sorry, of rolling an angle, uh, we'll try that again. Consider an experiment of rolling an equally spaced triangular spinner numbered one to three, oh, there's a three somewhere, and tossing two coins. It says draw a tree diagram to show all of the outcomes. So the first thing we can do is we can roll the spinner. There is three possible outcomes, a one, or a two, or a three. Then you can flip two coins. What are all the possible outcomes when you flip two coins? Heads, 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 tails, Tails, tails. Heads, heads. Heads, tails. Tails, tails. Heads, heads. Heads, tails. Tails, tails. tails, tails. 
Now, this is using the non-equally likely outcomes approach. I don't like that. I want instead of three options here, we said technically in the sample space, how many sample, how many elements are there in the sample space? Four. Dina, you're right. So I'm gonna go like this. Heads one, heads two, one, 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 two. And then I'm gonna add one more branch to each one of these if I can. I'm gonna say, okay. Here is, which one am I missing? Tails one, heads two. Nyoom. Tails one, heads two. Nyoom. Tails one, heads two. Now why is that so handy? Oh, it says list the sample space at the end of the tree. I don't want to list them all. Instead, I can show them to you Jen, one sample space is one tails heads. Another one is one heads heads. Another outcome is one heads tails. Another outcome is one tails tails. You can walk down any branch, and if you walk down every single branch systematically, you'll have listed the sample space, but they're contained in the tree. I like that better because it's way less writing. Dina, can you see one possible outcome is a three tails tails as well as a three tails heads, a three heads tails, and a three heads head. They're all there. How many outcomes are there? Count the number of branches. Brendan. Is there a way that we could have used the fundamental counting principle to figure that out? Well, it would have been, yeah, three numbers times four outcomes. The tricky part would have been ahead of time spotting that there was four outcomes. You probably would have had to make a list. Are all the outcomes equally likely? The way I've drawn it here, yes. So now I can answer these questions for part D. The probability of getting a 3 comma HH is... How many outcomes were there grand total? 12. How many outcomes are favorable? How many branches end in a, uh, go with a three heads heads? Just one. <clears throat> what about the probability of getting a prime number and exactly one tail? Uh, which of these numbers are prime? One is not prime by definition. Primes are any number greater than one. Is two prime? Yeah, two and three are both prime numbers because they only go into the only divisors they have are themselves and one. One is not considered prime. So here, here, and exactly one tail. I find what helps me a lot if I've done a tree is to simply change colors or not and put check marks under satisfactory outcomes. Here's a two and exactly one tail. Here's a two and exactly one tail. Here's a prime and exactly one tail. Here's a prime and exactly one tail. By doing that, it's very easy for me to spot the number of favorable outcomes. Oh, and by writing them below the tree, Madison, if I need to use this tree again, I just pull up my eraser, erase those check marks, and start over. Or if it's pen, scribble it out and start over. But I would think, well, how many favorable outcomes are there? Four out of? I know that's one-third. Doug, we're not going to reduce probabilities. Because 99% of the time, you're going to want a common denominator anyways. Now, they will reduce them in their final answer. So I will trust that you still remember your fraction button. Math, enter, enter. Now, this one you know is one-third. But for the more complicated ones, like the card questions that are over a question in the thousands, if they want me to reduce the fraction, I'm not going to. I'm just going to go like this. Math, enter, enter, and that's going to write it as the lowest terms fraction. Tree. When will I use a chart? Anytime I'm dealing with two dice. You know why? How many outcomes are there using the fundamental counting principle with two dice? How many branches would my tree have if I used a tree then? 36. No. 
Trees are for smaller samples, but they're better in a lot of ways. I use a chart for a dice. And in fact, what I would do, here we have a red die and a blue die. They've started this chart for me, but often I'll just freehand it. it would, I would write down red, blue. I would write numbers 1 through 6, 1 through 6. And then I would just add a line like that and like that. This is 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, fill it in. 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6. It takes about 10 seconds to do a dice chart, but it's so handy, it's well worth the while. 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, 5, 3, 4 is already there, 3, 6. says show all the possible outcomes in the array done how many points are in the sample space what did we say by using the fundamental counting principle 36 it says list the event the same number appears on both dice as a subset of the sample space by the way what do we call it when we're playing a game and we get the same number you roll it in Monopoly. Huh? Doubles? Do we not still call it doubles? No, that's only for two ones. That's only for a subset of the subset. I agree with you, Brandon, that that's one possible outcome, but if we're talking the same number, that's not snake eyes. Did I say Brandon? <laughs> Brett, caught myself now. <laughs> There's the list of all the doubles. Of course, I ran out of room when I move it over a little bit. Okay. By the way, if they don't give you this chart, and I will ask you a dice question on your test, I just go like this, freehand. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, 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 two, one, three. You can whip, you can write it very fast. So, what's the probability that the same number appears on both die? Or as we like to say when we play Monopoly, Brett, what's the probability of doubles? How many outcomes are there grand total? 36. How many favorable outcomes are there? Six. And I know that's one out of six in lowest terms. Who cares? Oh. What's the probability that a different number appears on each die? Or a shorter way to write that is, what's the probability of not doubles? Don't count. Use the complement. If 6 out of 36 is the odds of getting doubles, what are the odds of not getting doubles? 30 out of 36, because they are opposites to each other. There's no overlaps. It's the complement. That's where we use the complement. It would be way easier if they said, what are the odds of not getting doubles? I would find the odds of getting doubles, because I know there's only six of them. Count that, and then subtract. <coughs> Part of your homework today, but we're going to move on to lesson two as well. Number one.
three. Four. So I think I skipped two, yes? So one, skip two, three, four, skip five. Six is nice. Eight. Ten and eleven. Having said that, let's go to lesson two. Here is where the fundamental meat and potatoes kind of begin here. More terminology. And we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the events A or B and the events A and B. We got a bit of a problem here because the word or in math means a little bit different than it does in English. So, in mathematics, the event A or B is said to occur if A occurs, or B occurs, or both occur. And that's the difference between math and the English language. If I say to Doug, Doug, I have two chocolate bars. You can have a Snickers bar or a Mars bar. We understand in English, both is not an option. In math, it is. So in math, or means one or the other, or both. And what, oh, the event A and B occurs if both events occur simultaneously at the same time. And one of the better ways, one of the easy ways to visualize this is through something called a Venn diagram. All right. So it says this, consider the experiment of, noting a, of rolling a die and noting the result. Let the event A be an even number is thrown. Let the event B be an odd number is thrown. Put the outcomes into a Venn diagram. So our outcomes for rolling a die are the numbers 1 through 6. Which ones would end up in event A? If event A is an even number is thrown, which ones are here? Two, four, six. Which ones are here? One, three, five. Combine those two together, and that is the event rolling a die. So it says, list the outcomes for the event A. Can you see them from the Venn diagram? Two, four, or six. The event B, one, three, or five. What about the event A or B? So that means one or the other or both. Any numbers that appear in one or the other or both. I think, Madison, that's all of them. Now, the event A and B means which ones are happening at the same time. Are there any numbers that are odd and even at the same time? Empty set. Zero with a line through it. Don't just put a zero because zero is a number. Zero with a line through it. Okay. C says let N of A. I think we're going to skip straight to D. Looking at this Venn diagram, what's the probability of event A? I, I need something out of something. Three out of... Six. I know it's one out of two. We're not going to reduce. What's the probability of the event B? Also three out of six. What's the probability of the events oh, A or B? Six out of six, which is one. Right? Or means one or the other or both. Odd or even or both. 
There is no both in this case, but we're going to talk about what that means. Oh, what's the probability of A and B? Zero. Out of six, zero. Here's what I want you to notice. So here's some more terminology. Lots of terminology today. Um, this one, we're going to put a bit of a star around because this one they will ask you on. The other ones, you'll learn them naturally. This one, kids get mixed up. It says this. If A and B have no common outcomes, no overlap, they are mutually exclusive. And I'm going to put a big circle around there. Mutually exclusive means no overlap. Black cards and red cards are mutually exclusive. Are black cards and spades mutually exclusive? No, some spades are black. Are black cards and kings mutually exclusive? No, some kings are black. <coughs> are black cards and hearts mutually exclusive? Yes. Okay. And you can easily tell in a Venn diagram if they're mutually exclusive because there's no physical overlap. It says verify the following rule. The probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B. I think I said to you guys last unit, or means add. It does work. Next page. Okay. Once again, we're going to roll a die and note the result. The event A is... An even number is thrown. The event B is a multiple of 3 is thrown. Okay. Where is, what's going to go in A? A 2? A 4? Can I put the 6 right there? Why can't I put the 6 right there? It's also a multiple of 3. I need to put it right there because it's both. <coughs> what else is a multiple of 3? That's going to go right there because it's not even, but it is a multiple of 3. What number am I missing? Huh? What numbers am I missing? They go outside. There's my whole set. So it says, list the outcomes for the event A, 2, 4, or 6. List the outcomes for the event B, 2, sorry, B, Mr. Duick, look at the right diagram, 3, and 6. The event A or B. 2, 3, 4, or 6, one or the other, or both. You don't write the 6 twice, though, even though it appears in both. Uh, what's the event A and B? 6. Once again, we're going to skip C. We're going to see if we can go right down to D. So, what's the probability of A occurring? 3 out of 6. What's the probability of B occurring? 2 out of 6. What's the probability of A or B occurring? 4 out of 6. What's the probability of A and B occurring? Here's the question. Can you use these numbers to get an equation? And the short answer is, yeah. If you want to find the answer to or, it's the first one plus the second one minus the overlap. See it? 5 minus 1, 4. And that works from the previous page as well. If I wanted to find this answer here, or, it's the first one plus the second one 
minus the overlap. But what was the overlap in this earlier example? Because they're mutually exclusive, the overlap was zero. And this is going to give us our first official probability formula equation. So because these have common outcomes, they are not mutually exclusive. And this gives us our OR equation right here. The probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap. Oh, and if the overlap is zero, they're mutually exclusive. And you can use that because the overlap is zero. But I really don't do a big song and dance about this one because, Jen, it's a special subcase of the general equation right there. Jen, how many terms are there in this equation? Count them. Four. That means if you know three, you know one. If you know three, you know the fourth. So usually they want you to find, ah, sometimes they'll give you this and this and say find the overlap. Or sometimes they'll give you that and that and, uh, or that, that and that and say find the probability of B. Any, any three gives me four. So here are our key ideas so far. Events are said to be mutually exclusive if no overlap in the Venn diagram. And or means add, except we have to subtract any overlap because we'll have counted it twice. I'm going to put a box around this one, remembering that the upper equation is a special subcase. In other words, if this is true, then you know they're mutually exclusive. Lots of terminology, but hopefully, Doug, you're seeing the math so far, not too tough. We're counting. And I don't even think we need to pull off our shoes yet. We've been counting up to 10 at the most, I think. Oh, no, we did have a 36, didn't we? My bad. So, example one. State whether, turn the page if you haven't already, state whether the events A and B are mutually exclusive or not. A lot of this you can do with straight common sense. What you're asking is, is it possible for something to be both of these at the same time? Can you be a face card and a club? What's a face card? Jack, queen, or king. Is it possible to be a club and a jack, queen, king? So these are not mutually Exclusive. <coughs> um, what about this next one? Two dice are thrown as our event, our experiment. Event A is the dice both show the same value, Brett, what we call doubles. Event B is the total score is 11. Can you have a score of 11 and be showing doubles? Example two, which of these events are mutually exclusive? Which of these events can't happen at the same time? Adam, event what and event what? Okay, event A and C, you can't be a face card, and you can't be a jack, queen, king, and an ace at the same time. You're one or the other. B and D, can you be a club and a red card? Any others? I don't think so. So this is, Megan, the common sense approach to mutual exclusivity. And that's if you know enough about the event that you just know. There's also a mathematical approach where you don't know what the event is, you just know the probabilities. First of all, from a Venn diagram here, it says which ones are mutually exclusive? A is mutually exclusive from everything. B and D are mutually exclusive. 
my shit. Yeah, like A and C, but A and B and A and B. A is from everything. What I want to do is go to example four. Here's a mathematical one. It says, use the following information to determine whether the events A and B are mutually exclusive. And they've given me the probability of A, the probability of B, and or. I'm going to write down our equation. We said this. The probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap, A and B. This is on your formula sheet. You don't need to memorize it, although many of you will because you're lazy. When will this be mutually exclusive? This will be mutually exclusive if the AND term ends up working out to what? Zero. So let's plug in everything else. What's A or B? 7 over 12, 1 over 4, plus 1 over 3, is that 0? I'm not going to go fancy, I'm not going to go all common denominator -y. get your calculators out. I'm going to go 1 quarter plus 1 third. I'm going to hit enter, and then I'm going to hit math, enter, enter. You know what 1 quarter plus 1 third works out to in lowest terms? 7 twelfths. Oh, so what does this term work out to? It does work out to 0. Therefore, P of A and B equals 0. So, mutually exclusive. No overlap. And you'll notice I was able to do that, Dylan, even though I have no idea what events those are. No clue. Could be betting on something. I don't know. Could be the odds of your car starting. I don't know. A Venn diagram is very, very useful. In fact, I would say this. Anytime they give me two outcomes and percentages, I go Venn diagram. Example five. A grade nine class was surveyed to find out whether they did math homework or English homework last night. So, Looking at this, and assuming we're not talking about this class, what percent did math homework? And don't say 47, because 47 is wrong. What percent did math homework? Not 47. Evan, what? Or Sab, what? The entire circle with math in it adds to what? Do the math, please. I, I'm wanting more specific than... 63%. What percent did math and English homework? See the and? What's the and? 16. What percent did math or English homework? Now, from the formula, that means 1 plus the other minus the overlap. But from the quick Venn diagram, I think it's that plus that plus that. It's anything that appears in those circles. So I'm just quickly going to go 47 plus 16 plus 25. What's the correct answer? 88? Can you tell me another way I could have gotten the answer without adding? 100%, 1 as a decimal, minus 12%, 0.12 as a decimal. Now, if I had used the formula, by the way, to get or, probability of, write this down, please, M or E, it would be probability of E of M plus the probability of E minus the overlap.
and it would have been, right? Does that match this equation up here? Yep, except instead of using A and B, I'm using M and E. So M or E, first one, second one, overlap, and. What did we say the first one was? 63 plus, what percent did English homework? Not 25, 41 minus the overlap. Does that also give you 88? Check me, does it also give you 88? Yes, no, yes. Yeah. Which way is fastest, complement? Which way is second fastest? Uh, but for what it's worth, the formula would also have gotten me there if they had given me that. Two more, we're done. A single card is drawn from a standard deck of 52 cards. Use formulas to determine that the probability that a nine of diamonds or a heart is drawn. Dina, what word is that right there in the middle? So at the top of the page, let's write down the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap. There's our generic template. Um, instead of A, Amy, can I use uh, 9D for 9 diamonds? And instead of B, what would be a clever letter to use? H for heart? Okay, so this is wanting to find the probability of 9D or H. And that's going to be the probability of the first one plus the probability of the second one minus the probability of both. How many nine of diamonds are there in the deck? One out of how many cards are there in the deck? 52. 52, 52, plus, how many hearts are there in the deck? 13 divided by, how many cards are there in the deck? 52, minus, how many cards are nine of diamonds and hearts at the same time? I think that's a trick question. I think they're mutually exclusive. Zero. And this is why I said don't reduce fractions, because technically this is one quarter. But if I had reduced this, uh, don't they have a common denominator already built in if I don't reduce? In fact, what is 1 over 52 plus 13 over 52? In your head with no calculator, 14 out of 52. Good enough. Now let's compare that with B. Instead of a nine of diamonds or a heart, just a nine or a heart. Okay, that's going to be the probability of nine or H is going to be the probability of nine plus the probability of H minus the probability of nine and H. Right? I'm just filling in that template formula. I rarely use A and B. I usually try and pick letters that make or, or symbols that make sense to me. All right. Evan, what's the probability of a 9? 4 out of 52. Plus 13 out of 52. Minus how many 9s are hearts at the same time? 1 out of 52. 4 plus 13 pl minus 1, 17 take away 1, 16 
out of 52. So here's a question. If you had to bet, which of these two would be a better bet? Yeah, B. They're both lousy, by the way, because they're not above 50%. They're both terrible bets. So I guess I should really say, instead of asking which of these would be the better bet, which of these would be the less terrible bet? Uh, B. The odds are slightly better. Barely, but slightly. And I don't think you would see that intuitively just by glancing at it. <coughs> Example 7. 200 people with neurology symptoms which includes headaches and backaches, backaches, participate in a study to evaluate a pain relief medicine. 60 people experienced headache relief, 126 experienced backache relief, 36 experienced both. How many categories are there in this question? There's two, headache and backache. This is where a Venn diagram, not a formula, shines. I used a formula with the previous one because in cards there's all sorts of categories, black, red, face, forget it. Here what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a Venn diagram like this with some overlap. And whenever I'm doing a Venn diagram, I want to try and find the overlap first, if at all possible. How many people are in the overlap category? How many people? Both. 36. I'll put a little 36 right there. How many people got relief from headaches? 60. Now a lot of, oh, I'm going to call this one headaches and I'll call this one backaches in my high-tech numbering system. And a lot of people, Doug, want to put a 60 right there. That's wrong. Why is that wrong? How many people do you have in your headaches by putting a 60 right there? Not 60. How many do you have? 96. So I don't put a 60 right there. What number is going to go right there? It's got to be 24. Can't be 60. Oh, Kelvin, what do those two together add up to? 60. There's your 60 that got headache relief. 36 got both. Only 24, it got their headache, but it didn't get their backache. <clears throat> oh, 126 people got backache relief. I'm not going to put, this is wrong, I'm not going to put 126 there. What's going to go there? 90. Oh, Vitaly, how many people were in this study? Read the question. How many people were in the study? 200. So how many people did this drug not work for? Do the math. How will you calculate that? 200 minus 24 minus 36 minus 90. How many people did this drug not work for? And this is some of the basic math behind clinical drug trials and things like that. How many? Anyone? 50, 5, 0, or 1, 5? Five? 5, 0? Okay. Now I've got my Venn diagram set up. Now I can answer the questions. What's the probability that you get at least one of the two symptoms? Now, at least one of means headache or backache. Because remember, we said uh, or means one or the other or both. Now, we could do this with a formula. But isn't it going to be 26 plus 36 plus 90? Or better yet, isn't it going to be 200 minus 50? I think the probability that someone got relief from at least one symptom is that. 75%, I heard somebody say, yeah, which is, for a medication, pretty good. Uh, what are the odds that it didn't work for you? Now, how would I write this? I would write this as not A or B. That's the abbreviation for neither. And it's 50 out of 200. So we've thrown a lot at you.
terminology and Venn diagrams and the OR equation. I think you folks are getting the, well, okay, I guess, number one, it's going to skip it, but no. Four. Five. Uh, skip 5C. So 5A and B. Six. Seven, eight. Nine, ten. Oh, an election. Yeah, I'm going to go 11, 12. There's not going to be as much homework next class. It's a lot I threw at you, I know. But we're trying to get the sprint going for the home stretch. And you do have about almost 15, 12, well, yeah, 15 almost minutes to work. Okay.